Missourians are more polarized, Americans are more polarized. I mean, you could throw in social media and how in and, and term limits and how everybody's jockeying for position and, and demonizing this and you're not you're not that and trying to get to that next office and you know, so I need to run to the right of this person or to the left of this person and, and it's just so easy to put information out on social media that is one-sided or you're just speaking to, to, to your group and, and you're trying to just fire up your base. You know, really there isn't much bipartisanship. It's, I need to placate my base so I have to say all this stuff right here. And, and that just, you know, sends out a message that is so much more, more divisive. So, I mean, definitely think, yeah, we're much more polarized than when we were there. Americans appear to be increasingly divided over politics. The gap between the policies endorsed by the Republican and Democratic parties is growing, as is animosity between people who identify with different parties. In the early 1990s, the two parties had more similar policy agendas than they do today. Over the last 25 years, the Democratic Party has moved more to the left, while the Republican Party has moved more to the right. The gap between the policy positions of the Democratic and Republican parties is also growing, and more Americans now identify consistently with the main policy positions of their party than in previous years. People often change their political beliefs to match the positions of their parties, which reinforces divides between the parties. Americans also tend to have greater feelings of dislike toward members of the other political party than they have had in previous years. What causes polarization and how has it affected Missouri lawmaking? Polarization is complex and experts are still debating the exact factors that contribute to it. Some scholars believe that the increased influence of political activists has widened the gap between the two parties' platforms. Other causes are attributed to changes in election policy, in-group psychological bias, and partisan media bubbles. So one of the challenges I think today that's different than when I was in the legislature is, is really the role of the, the press. In the Senate chambers back then, there was a press table that sat uh, you know, on the right side of the Senate chamber. I think there were probably eight, maybe ten slots uh, on that press table. And there were a couple old members of the press, Bob Pretty with Missouri Net, Phil Brooks, who was a professor at MU that uh, wrote for the Missourian. And they really controlled uh, which members of the press got to sit at that table. So you had to work your way up to that. If they hadn't been around the Capitol for a while, they didn't get to sit at the press table. So when I left in 2010, we had interns from the Columbia Missourian, the J School at Mizzou, sitting at the press table because the press staff that used to cover the state Capitol had been decimated. All the newspapers started pulling back, cutting budgets. The downside was that we, we lost this lens on the General Assembly and the Senate as people stopped reading newspaper. You saw the rise of Fox News on the right, MSNBC on the left, uh, and people started viewing news from their own particular lens. And you compound that uh, with social media. And I think all that combined has brought us to this, this place we're right, at right now, which is, you know, we have an electorate that is extremely polarized. They tend to go off in their own camps. Their view of the world is, is all right, and the view of the other side is all wrong. It makes it very difficult to compromise, and I think that's the environment they're in right now. So I always, always take that back, is when I saw the, really the decimation of the independent press covering the General Assembly, and I think to a certain extent that happens at the local level, whether it's city councils or at the national level where it's Congress, uh, where you have these people giving these typically unbiased views of what's happening, that doesn't happen right now, and your, your views come from press that tend to start from a biased view. I think that's led us to where we're at right now. At the Missouri Net, we had an aggressive newsroom that could not be intimidated and could not be bought or persuaded to ignore issues and people who deserve the spotlight. We were protected by Clyde Lear, the founder of our company, in more ways than one, himself a journalist who understood the importance of a free, unafraid press and the necessity of a, to a free society of having that free, unafraid press, especially in the local and regional areas. Long ago, 
I first heard the words of Walter Williams, the founder of the School of Journalism, the first one in the country, who wrote, I believe in the profession of journalism. I believe that the public journal is a public trust and that all connected with it are to the full measure of their responsibility, trustees for the public. That acceptance of a lesser service than the public service is a betrayal of that trust. That our two-thirds majorities in both houses of the General Assembly have worked against us. I think term limits have worked against us. And I think that right now there's probably less bipartisanship in the General Assembly than ever before, partly because of, of what has happened, say, in the last 25 to 30 years politically on the national as well as state level, and partly because of term limits, which I think have been the worst thing to happen to Missouri politics since the loyalty oaths of the Civil War. It took away a lot of institutional history, institutional knowledge. You need someone to tell you to na how to navigate some of the pitfalls, and there were a lot of pitfalls uh, in terms of not knowing what has happened previously. And so you could potentially walk into some of the same situations and challenges that you've had before. So I was fortunate enough to have, uh, right at the beginning of my career, many of the senior members. Uh, Wayne Good was an absolutely fantastic mentor for me. Paula Carter was, Sheila Lumpy, and of course, Sue Shear, who, I mean, I just adored the fact that she hung in there that long. I had a rich uh, background uh, from which to draw from in terms of how I formulated my legislation and my ideas about things, quite frankly. But Missouri politics has not always been so divisive. The following stories highlight Missouri lawmakers who cooperated in a bipartisan fashion, treated their political foes with civility and respect, and even opponents who remained friends after debate on the Senate floor ended. Wayne Good, when he was in the House, had been the Appropriations Chairman, and John T. Russell was the Senate Appropriations Chairman when this was happening. Now, these two men came into the legislature at the same time, 1963. They wound up serving 42 years together before they were forced out of the General Assembly because of term limits. Only one man in Missouri history ever served more years in the General Assembly than these two did. That was Michael Kinney a senator from St. Louis who served 56 years, all of them in the Senate, which is kind of a record, almost nationally. So these two men, polar opposites politically, but also bound together by a commonly shared history in the General Assembly. And they had all this background of knowing how the General Assembly could work and knowing how government should work and they were able to share the leadership of the Appropriations Committee at this crucial time when politics was changing in Missouri. And so the budget that year was worked out with these two men who were not afraid to talk across the aisle to one another, who were not afraid to lead members of the Republican Party and lead members of the Democratic Party who were on this critical committee and come together so they could put together a budget. And that, I think, is, is a time when we saw statesmanship which has been dwindling in politics generally in America and even in the General Assembly. And it's been dwindling even more with a two-thirds majority now. But this is the value we had of longtime service in the General Assembly and personal relationships as well as political relationships that were formed during that time. And that stood the state in good stead that year when we got the budget taken care of. And it was a good, solid budget and a responsible budget. And these two men who today their counterparts probably don't speak to each other. They don't go have dinner together after a session during the day. In those days, there was a camaraderie, there was a fellowship, there was a mutual respect that crossed party lines for the benefit of the people of Missouri. I don't think we see that enough today in Missouri. I was in the position of being a former local school board member, somebody that had worked a lot around education, uh, also had served on the Budget Committee in the, in the House, the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. So I knew a lot about education funding. So when it came to the point that we needed a new foundation formula, that was the bill that I ended up sponsoring. Although those things are very complicated and there's always winners and losers in that. They get passed about every 20 years because they're just so difficult uh, to get everybody on the same page. So we started the process, uh, meaning with House members, Senate members, uh, late nights uh, in my office every Monday night. And then we did that for, I don't know, it was probably eight weeks before we brought a bill out to the floor 
uh, and it was House members, senator, senators, Republicans, Democrats, uh, each talking about what would make up a good foundation for them. So we brought it out to the floor. It's still very contentious, very difficult, because as I said, there's winners and losers in foundation formulas. And the fact that we laid the groundwork early on and brought people together, that everybody involved in writing that formula knew that the other person was acting on good faith. And that was the success of passing a foundation formula. So that was back, I think, in 2006. Uh, that foundation formula is still law right now, and there's really, uh, it's hard to fathom passing another foundation formula particularly in the era we have now with term limits, would, would make it even more difficult than it was back then. But that's an example of, of bringing people together early on, saying what you have to get done, going through a process, letting everybody have their say, and then finally passing a piece of very difficult, challenging legislation. I was really able to work across uh, party lines on several issues there, and uh, I can only rem remember the main one really was um, had to deal with a midwifery bill, and uh, John Loudon was the sponsor. I think we were in the minority at the time. Democrats were in the minority. He was uh, absolutely in favor of midwifery, and many in his party did not appreciate that. And I said, well, you know, John, let me tell you a little bit of, about, you know, my people. And that was all we had at one point. We could not go to hospitals and, you know, these fancy clinics at people. And so we had to depend on midwives to deliver our children. And uh, and so I said, I, I truly support what you're trying to do here. And uh, I don't know where he got the language from, but it was so subversive and it was a, a getting to exactly what we needed to do but if you didn't really really read it you wouldn't catch it and so I was reading that and then I turned around and I said oh my god this is it and he said we can't say that <laughs> we can't say that if we want this bill to pass we can't let on, you know, and so, you know, we got through the process. I didn't, sp I used to speak on just about every bill and I didn't speak. And I don't know if they noticed that it passed, <laughs> it passed. And I was shocked. But again, he was as Republican and anti-choice as I was Democrat and pro-choice. But that was an issue that we could collaborate on. We could agree on the need for midwives, you know, legislating midwives and the, the qualification and things like that so that they, they would, uh, women would be comfortable in, in going to midw midwives for their children. And so, but that was one of the main things that really struck out in my mind in terms of bipartisanship collaboration. We met when he came into the state Senate. I think you were delivering a, a filibuster on the floor and I, you know, wanted the bill to pass. And so I started to send him a note. We'd, we'd pass a note to the doorman, and the doorman would run it down. And I was sending him notes like, your neighbor called, and your house is on fire. You need to go and, and to try to get him to stop talking to get off the floor so we could pass the bill. And I just kept sending him like silly notes like that. And, and I think after that, we, we laughed about it, and that's kind of when we kind of started joking around a little bit. But our friendship grew and evolved into more substantive types of, of cooperation. There was a bill that Scott filed, I believe, in 2008 that uh, centered on immigration issues. And there was one component of the bill that bothered me a lot uh, as originally filed. The bill would have prohibited um, any undocumented you know, young person from attending a Missouri state college or university. When I came in and talked to him, you know, I just sat in his office and I said, look, I understand why you're doing these other things in the bill, but, but this part of the bill really bothers me because, you know, imagine if, you know, you came here when you were seven years old and you worked your, your tail off to be able to go to a good college and then your state is telling you that all of that was for naught. And he listened and uh, he suggested a compromise. The interesting piece to, to that story is, is that Jeff came to talk to me. A lot of times, someone, they would send a staffer or have a staffer go talk to your staffer. Well, this senator doesn't like this and they want this change up. Jeff came, sat down, we chatted, and within a few minutes, we could figure out, okay, where we could both be, that that a lot of times didn't, didn't happen. And so the fact that, that, that we had a face-to-face -face conversation that wasn't through intermediaries, and a lot of times, unfortunately, is you would get on the floor 
and you'd be presenting your bill and you'd be doing that, and then all of a sudden somebody would stand up and start railing against it and have all these amendments and stuff to change it and never come talk to you. And so what I found with Jeff was that if there's something that we, we don't agree on, which was a lot of, of stuff back then, if we just went and talked, we could probably find a solution and stuff that we'd benefit. We'd, we worked together on college aid for scholarships. We did the immigration stuff. We did stuff on school choice. I mean, it was just, it started this pattern of he's reasonable and you can work with him. And we built that relationship and that friendship and, and it was something that we could, we could trust each other. Criminal laws were really a hodgepodge uh, where the sentencing was inconsistent. The, the way that crimes were defined was inconsistent. And so it was a jumble, and it became necessary then to rewrite the criminal code. That, of course, you might imagine is a gigantic proposition, a huge problem, because criminal laws make up hundreds of pages of our state statutes. The two people who were involved in this, as it turned out, were polar opposites in many ways. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, for the first time since the 1830s, was not a lawyer. He was a Springfield businessman named Bob Dixon, a conservative Republican. The minority leader of the state Senate at that time was Jolie Justice, a Kansas City lawyer, a liberal, the first openly gay member of the state Senate, and only the third openly gay member of the legislature. And so you have this strong conservative from the Bible Belt of southwest Missouri, and you have this liberal Democrat senator who were working together to rewrite the criminal code. We had one who was a lawyer who dealt in pro bono services, the free legal services that law firms provide, and you have another who was a businessman who had no background as a lawyer. And he somehow was in charge of judiciary, she was the ranking member on judiciary, two people who you would think personally and politically would be completely at odds, especially when it came to philosophy of crime and punishment. And in 2014, they passed a Senate bill of about 600 pages in length that reformed and streamlined our criminal code. There were some things that they decided were not prisonable offenses. There were some things they decided needed more flexibility in sentencing. There were some new crimes that it needed better definition. And so they came up with this through months and months and months of hearings and studies and, and rewriting and writing. And the end result was, they passed this bill and sent it to the governor. The deal was worked out, and again, this is a remarkable thing that happened. There was a House bill, a House counterpart to the Senate bill, and it was still in process. And so these two senators got together with the people in the House and said, these are the things that the governor objects to. We'll correct them in the House bill, and the Senate will pass it, and we'll send it to the governor. So the House and the Senate managed to get together and agree on this major thing, while within the Senate, these two polar opposite types of people led the Senate effort to get that bill through too. So as we rewrote our entire system of criminal laws, we had these two pretty impressive bipartisan, by chambers, if you will, legislation that worked its way through. So that was, to me, in, in the latter stages of my career, probably one of the finest examples of, of interchamber cooperation, interparty cooperation, and cooperation between two people that you might look at them and think, these two folks are not going to be too compatible. But they were. They worked together very well. They worked together at a very high professional level. And sometimes if you can work together at a high professional level, that overcomes any political shortcomings that there might be or differences between the two parties. The year I was elected was 2006, and I was sworn into office in January of 2007. And every new legislator has the opportunity, at least um, in pre-pandemic times, every new legislator has the opportunity to go on a bus tour of the state of Missouri and learn everything about the state. So you visit universities and research centers, Department of Correction facilities, hospitals, you get to know local elected officials. It's a really great opportunity to get to know the state that you're going to be governing the, the following months. And so I took that freshman bus tour, and like I said, it was 2006 when we took the tour, 
And if you remember in 2004, one of the hottest issues in the country was the issue of gay marriage. And across the country, there were state legislatures who were trying to put in the Constitution a ban of same-sex marriage. And Missouri did that. In uh, 2004, they passed a piece of legislation that put it to a vote of the people. Um, actually, Missouri was the first state in the union to have the constitutional amendment go to an election, and that was in August of 2004. Why was this important to me? Well, in addition to all the other things that I was bringing to Jefferson City, I had been elected as the first openly gay state senator in the, in the state of Missouri. So it was historical in nature that I was heading down there in the first place. When I got off the bus in Farmington, Missouri, I will never forget it, I stepped off the bus and there was this man standing there. He was a bulk of a man. He was very, very tall, bald, wide-shouldered, and he stuck his hand out and he said, Senator Justice, I am the redneck homophobe who banned gay marriage in the state of Missouri. And I was taken a little bit aback because um, you're not really sure how to respond to something like that. And, and the man who introduced himself was Senator Kevin Engler. He uh, represented the Farmington area, and he actually, when he was in the House, had carried the piece of legislation that put the same-sex marriage ban on the ballot. I think a decision that I made at that moment was really critical because I decided that Senator Engler was trying to introduce himself to me, that he was putting out there um, our major differences right from the beginning. And so I shook his hand and I said, great to meet you. And I will tell you from that point forward, it really was amazing what personal relationships and civility can bring to a conversation even about some of the toughest issues that you have in Jefferson City. Because over time, Senator Engler and I continued that friendship. We would sit and spend our break times together and we'd talk about our families and our friends and our dogs and all of the things that, that make a person a person. And, and over time, we had a trust for each other. And so it was about a year later that I got a call. It turns out that Senator Engler had a constituent in his office who wanted to talk to him about LGBT issues. And at the time in the state of Missouri, it was perfectly legal to fire someone because they were gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, or because you thought they were. You could um, kick them out of their housing, you could kick them out of a public accommodation because of their sexuality. And so um, there were folks up in Jefferson City that day who were there to lobby and say, we need to change Missouri's non-discrimination laws. And I get to his office and he said, Senator Justice, he said, did you know that it's legal to fire someone because they're gay? And I said, yes, Senator, I, I know that. And he said, well, that's wrong. And I said, yes, Senator, I believe it's wrong as well. And he said, well, what are we going to do about it? And I said, well, it's nice that you would ask. I actually have this bill called the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act and we're trying to change that. Would you like to help us? And he said, yes, I would. He went on to talk a lot about his faith and how that he wasn't with us still on the marriage issue, but that he felt that his faith led him to believe that we shouldn't fire someone because they're gay and that he wanted to help. From that moment forward, we became, you know, really not just friends, but allies in trying to pass this Missouri Non-Discrimination Act. And we kept pushing it together the whole time that he was in the Senate. And then he moved on. He actually went back to the House of Representatives because of term limits. He was termed out of the Senate, but he could still go back to the House. So it was really an opportunity for us to you know, work together on issues that we thought were probably going to be issues that would keep us apart, but instead brought us together. There was a moment when I got off that bus in Farmington when Senator Engler could have just said, hi, I'm Senator Engler, nice to meet you. And instead, he up front addressed the issue that he thought was going to be the biggest issue between the two of us. And I could have been a jerk and just said hello and walked off. But instead, we took that opportunity to learn more about each other personally. It allowed us to move policy forward in a way that would not have been possible. Because of those relationships that I had with Senator Engler and with the other folks that I served with, you know, they came to me and trusted me on all sorts of issues, criminal justice reform, foster care. I mean, all of the issues that I was passionate about, they listened. And they couldn't always vote with me, 
But because we made those decisions to treat each other with respect from the beginning, I think that's, that's the real story here is that, that there's more about us that we have in common than, than really sets us apart. And if we focus on those things, the things that set us apart are gonna be easier to talk about. These Missouri lawmakers came together across the aisle to work on extremely difficult issues, from women's health to immigration, to education, to crime and punishment. How can policymakers and individual citizens display political courage today to mitigate ideological sectarianism in America, as Missourians find themselves living and socializing with people who share their ideological views how do we get out of our echo chambers and build a political culture that's focused on ideas and not unbridgeable identities? Statesmen will always put country or state, community before party. That's the central quality of a statesman to me. And when I came into the legislature, I quickly found out that disability rights was a partisan issue. I was like, why? And so after years of working on these issues and trying to get people educated and bring it down, we did so many great things in the legislature with individuals with disability, with you know, autism insurance coverage and, and things of that nature, that the thing I'm most proud of when I left the legislature was that that issue was no longer a partisan issue. It was bipartisan, everyone looked at it, as a, a value-based thing that was not divided by, by party lines. And to me, that was the biggest thing I, I, I was proud of. But it was taking those partisan things out of things that should never be partisan and working together to move, move the ball forward. America, as we've sorted ourselves into these, you know, little groupings based on our, our cultural affinities, we've stopped talking to one another. And one of the great things about the Missouri Senate is that the right of unlimited debate, the right to speak as long as you want with a filibuster, usually forces people to have to talk to each other to, you know, across party, regional, ideological lines uh, in a way that they probably wouldn't otherwise, and in a way that they frankly don't in the, in the House of Representatives in near the same way. And you have to really look for the common ground. You cannot just assume it's going to be there. You have to look at issues, issues that may uh, cross party lines. You know, you're looking at any kind of issue that, that may relate to your people and, and my people and your constituents and my constituents. It's, it's really having to really d do a deep dive into what we have in common rather than, you know, what we don't agree on. When you look at this issue and you take it away from how you're looking at it and you look at it through someone else's eyes and the values of which their life and their, their situation is, is surrounding them, it gives you an inkling of how they're thinking so you don't demonize them and say, well, they're just, you know, just, or they don't want to have freedom. And it's so easy to lump people into, the, into those categories. But just Jeff and I spending time together and him explaining how his constituents see it and it's not as, you know, just a, you know, you're this way and I'm this way. And it really just made me stop and think. And when an issue comes up that is very divisive, I try to do what he said. And it's like, what is the, the driving value? Because you're not going to move someone off a value proposition. I mean, that is something that has ingrained them. And so if I can understand that, then I can recognize, okay, I, I am not going to argue with you for your, your belief because it is, it, is a, it is a value to you. It's not something that you've just decided by looking at some facts and figures and this is the way and you can be convinced. And so it just kind of really helped me understand the opposition argument to a lot of issues better. And then I think helped me, you know, communicate with them better to try to find, you know, compromises. You know, if legislators can take the long view and realize that, you know, they're passing legislation that will have an impact for generations, not necessarily uh, the next year or two during their term, I think that that's really important. I think that's challenging and difficult to do. I think it's even challenging given the political environment they're in, in right now. You know, it's easy to think that you have all the good ideas and the other side has all the bad ideas. And the reality of it is, 
Uh, once you realize that you're not as smart as you think you are and they're not as dumb as you think they are, um, things tend to go a little bit better. What makes me hopeful for the future is that we've been here before in one way or another. Somehow we found a way out of it. It's always painful and it's, it's exceptionally painful right now. But I still believe that, that people, there's a goodness in people and there's an understanding that will come to people sooner or later and they will begin to look around and see what has happened to us and there will be a recovery. John Meacham talked about it in his book, The Soul of America, as the number of times that we have reached this point. And I believe that we can recover again. Uh, we, go through, we go through periods of ups and downs in our history and in our political system. And now I think, to me, we're in a downtime. And I think the proper kind of leadership that encourages us instead of curries favor with us, that challenges us to be better than we are, instead of appealing to the worst of our angels. That's the kind of political leadership and personal leadership we have to have and we have to be. I always have hope for the future and it's because I know there are still a lot of people, myself included, who will never give up. Um, one of the things that I have made as my personal mantra is don't give up on anybody. I will always attempt to find ways where we can connect on some issue, even if it's a very, very small issue. There were senators that I did not meet, really, really substantively get to know until I'd been there three years. And it took a lot of time, but I didn't give up because I knew that at some point when we all treat each other with that basic humanity, we will be able to find our way to some sense of civility. And I think we're gonna be able to head in that, in that direction. So the more conversations we have like this one today, I think will inspire others to do that. When we have young elected officials who are just getting into office, we need to encourage them by getting them reelected if they're those type of individuals who are really willing to stand up against some of the partisan politics that are out there today and do what's right. This era will go down in history as a very, very tough time for the United States and for the state of Missouri, but we've made it through worse and we're gonna make it through this one.